What's up, you guys? How you doing today? My name is Guy Fietti, and we're rolling out. I'm going to take you across the country to find America's greatest diners, drivers, and dives. No, my name is Trez. It's the horrible show. I'm sorry. Um, let's see what's on the to-do list for today. I'm going to throw up. Touche. The day has finally been bestowed upon us. We have the Almighty Criterion collection going on today. I have 33 releases for you. Uh, it's going to be a little bit of a lengthy video. Might want to go grab some snacks, take a poop, you know. Hey, you could bring this phone. If you're watching us on the phone, you could bring it into the bathroom with you. And then we can poop together or whatever. whatever. Nothing that's weird. Or unless you want it to be. But nothing weird. Let's get down to it. <laughs> Try to buy a house, but I got no money because I spend all my money on criterion. Trying to feed my kids, but I got no money. Gonna feed them with my criterions. Gonna rob a bank because I got no money. Gonna do five to ten because my criterion. Now I'm in the gang and life is very strange. Gonna do more time because it's criterion. you guys let's start off with number one we have Roman Polanski's Repulsion this movie came out in 1975 it's shot in glorious black and white and this movie is essentially about uh, you have two sisters living in the same house and one of them goes on vacation and the other one is left with her thoughts and her madness and the slow descent into crazy town she goes to crazy town I didn't know what to think uh, before I watched this film, um, I was I was under the impression that it was more of a horror, more of a horror movie. But it is really the the camera angles are amazing. Uh, whether you like Roman Polanski as a person or not, you have to give him credit because his movies are fantastic. I love this movie. I think it is clever. I think it's well done. There's a scene with a rabbit that it it, it shows uh, over time. And it, it gets me every time. Repulsion, uh, if you are a, a psychological thriller fan, if you are a horror fan, I think this is a must see. Whether you like this movie or not, it might seem a little dated. If you're not into older movies, um, it, it might give you a hard time, but I really think you should see this. Uh, there's the back if you'd like to check that out. And it is spine number 483. Number two, we have Orson Welles' F is for Fake. And the reason why I picked this up, this movie came out in 1975, is that uh, I watched a lot of lists saying that this was one of the most underrated Orson Welles movies. I'm not going to go and say that I know anything about Orson Welles, except for a few key movies. Uh, he directed this. This movie is about trickery. It is about lies. It is about uncovering the, the camera tricks and the tricks that filmmakers use. This is spine number 288. Pick number three, we have The Spy Who Came In From The Cold. And this is a Cold War era thriller from 1965. Um, this was directed by, please excuse me, Paul Dean and Guy Trosper, uh, which I don't know of them. I don't know of any other movies that they, they put out. Uh, I was in my Barnes and Noble and this title really grabbed me. I know it's based off a book it says, The Spy Who Came In From The Cold is a hard-edged and tragic thriller suffused with political and social consciousness that defined Ritt's career. And Ritt is the producer, uh, Martin Ritt. They say this book was cold and enticing and thrilling and, and brutal. They even use the words brutal. So this has uh, Richard Burton in it. So I'm very excited to see this. Um, I, like, I like movies with paranoia. I like movies that get under your skin that make you feel for the main character, if they're gonna get caught, if there's, uh, if there's somebody that doesn't trust them or somebody that's watching them. So I'm really looking forward to this movie, um, shot in black and white. Uh, this was my pick number three, and it was it's spy number number 452. This is Brian De Palma's Sisters. This movie came out in 1973. Um, it's got Margot Kidder, it's got Jennifer Salt, uh, Hitchcockian, it's a Brian De Palma movie, so 
I hope uh, this is probably his first movie, his first delve into the uh, voyeuristic, creepy. He he does a lot of voyeurism. He's just like Hitchcock in that. I watched uh, a Phantom of the Paradise the other day, and there's a lot of voyeurism in that too. This movie has a bone chilling score uh, by frequent Al Alfred Hitchcock uh, collaborator Bernard Herrmann. Um, if you've ever seen Reanimator, if I'm asking if you've never seen Psycho, but you've seen Reanimator, it's uh, the same score. I really enjoy Brian De Palma's camera angles, and I really enjoy the split screen. If I was going to say anything about Brian De Palma, I freaking love the split screen. I really do. I think it works so effectively in Carrie. I think in Phantom of the Paradise, it was great, even though he almost verbatim stole uh, a, a, a scene from Hitchcock himself about a bomb in a... Uh, in a car, but this is spy number 89. It's probably hard to see. Our next pick we have for number four, we have Midnight Cowboy. This is John Voight. This is Dustin Hoffman. This movie came out in 1969, and it is the first X-rated film to win an Academy Award for Best Picture. Um, I don't know much about this movie. I know that I'm walking here. I'm walking here. I know that scene, and I always wanted to know where the movie came from. I saw this in my local Barnes & Noble. And reading the back, it is uh, two hustlers in in New York, and they're just trying to live their lives, try to be su successful in whatever they want to accomplish. This is a movie directed by John Sl Schlesinger. 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 This is spine number nine twenty five, and I'm really looking forward to watching this. I love I love m movies about old New York. Next, we have David Cronenberg's The Brood. This movie came out in 1979. This is spine number 777. And this movie is about a disturbed woman taking a uh, remote form of uh, psychoanalyst and two connecting storylines between a girl being haunted by demons and then uh, this woman going through whatever the hell she's going through. This movie's crazy. I don't know if you've ever seen it. This movie's crazy as hell. And it's surprising. I really do enjoy this movie. I really enjoy uh, this Criterion release, uh, you would think that they would put out uh, The Fly by David Cronenberg. You, you guys know what I'm talking about, The Fly? That was disgusting. Did I do it? <laughs> I didn't know if I was going to do it or not, but that's good. Now, I'm really looking forward to uh, revisiting this. Um, and this also has, I didn't look at the special features, but it looks like it has a uh, a 4K digital transfer of Cronenberg's 1970 feature, Crimes of the Future, supervised by the director. So that's pretty cool. If there's a, a bonus film on here, uh, it might just be a short film. But um, if you're really into uh, creepy horror, so. Spine number 777, 1979. Cronenberg. Cronenberg. Okay, y'all. This is my number, what is this? This is number seven in my recommendations. This is House, or Hasu, right? Hasu. Um, this movie came out in 1977. Um, it is by Ubuniku Ubiyashi. God, I probably butchered that. Dudes, have you seen this movie? If you have not seen this movie, I would like you to turn off this video and then go buy this movie. Uh, Masters of Cinema has a version of this movie. Criterion Collection has a version of this movie. This movie is fucking bananas, bro. It is... I didn't really know what to expect. I went in thinking um, that it was going to be just kind of like a haunted house movie. And it is like, it's like an acid trip. It's like, uh, how do they describe it? They say it's an episode of Scooby-Doo directed by Mario Bava. And it's absolutely insane. Uh, the narrative is a little shaky, but I'm telling you the visuals that you will never see a movie like this ever, ever in your life. Uh, other than this. I had never seen anything like this. I don't think I'll ever see anything like this uh, again besides this movie. Uh, about a half hour in, I absolutely fell in love. I thought it was a a, a brilliant, uh, quirky... It's cool to watch, man. Like, uh, I thought the, the music was pretty fantastic throughout. Sometimes the music came off... Like, should they really be playing this, like, upbeat pop music in here? But it just... It, Something that just added to the strangeness of the film. It's by number 300. It's by number 539. Uh, yeah, I thoroughly recommend. 
thoroughly recommend this movie because it did weird things to me, man. Did weird things to me, man. All right, so check this out. If you do not, 1977, I would do a double bill, double bill with this and Suspiria if you just want to geek out and just be crazy and not know what life is for uh, almost three and a half hours. Thoroughly recommend it. Enjoy it. Next up we have Kaidan, or Kaidan, uh, however you pronounce it. This movie came out in 1965 and is directed by Mukashi Kobayashi. Mukashi Kobayashi? Yeah. And this movie intrigued me because, of course, being that I'm a horror fan, um, I went online and you know I'm going to look for the Criterion releases that are more aimed towards the horror genre. And I was also told that this was maybe the longest running theatrical horror movie ever made, which uh, really blew my mind. It comes in at a whopping uh, three hour cut, never before released in the United States. So what sold me on this is that it is a Japanese set of ghost stories, which, uh, as I said, I, I watched uh, Hasu, and then I've been watching more like, uh, you know, like the resurgence in the 90s and stuff like that. Totally different era here. I just realized there's so many more, uh, one, Japanese films, two, Japanese horror that I know nothing about that I have to get better at. This is spine number 90, and this is Kaidan, or Kaidan. Yeah. This is a really beat up copy. A DVD copy of Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. This movie came out in 1998. It is a film by Terry Gilliam. Uh, I don't know about you, but when I was a teenager, I went through different types of novels. I read my Bukowski's, I read my Polonics, my Kirk Vonnegut. And there's something to be said about people in life. You meet these characters that just don't give a fuck. And it's crazy. Um, and Hunter S. Thompson, Seemed like he was one of those dudes. Uh, I have not watched this movie yet, but I've read the book, uh, surprisingly. And I'm not trying to be like, oh, I read the book. I'm, you know, I'm not trying to be that guy, but I did. Uh, when I was a teenager, it's been a long time, but I did read the book when I was a teen, and it was very funny. Johnny Depp and uh, Benicio Del Toro are in this too. Uh, this is spot number 175. Uh, yeah, this is Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Pick number 10. Uh, we have 1960s Eyes Without a Face, and it's real, uh, this is a French film, and the real name of this, if I can pronounce it right, is Ha Ha Wee Wee Wee, by director uh, Georgie Francois. <laughs> so this is about, so this is about a uh, doctor that has a daughter with a disfigured face, so he goes and uh, tries to perform numerous face transplants. If that doesn't sell you, if that doesn't sell you on this movie, uh, a lot of uh, the stack was actually a lot black and white. If that does not sell you on this movie, I don't know what will. If you're a horror fan, take a journey. Take a journey, grab a baguette, and uh... Yeah, grab some French toast, grab some French fries, grab your favorite accordion, and just enjoy this movie. Accordions, those aren't even French. Are they Italian? God, I am a piece of garbage. Uh, number 260, Eyes Without a Face. Ha and one of, uh, I don't know if this is last, no, we still got more horror in here. But this is Don't Look Now. This movie came out in 1973. Uh, Donald Sutherland, Julie Christie. Uh, this movie is extremely trippy. It was it was directed by Nicholas Roig. Hope I pronounced that right. Um, this movie is shot in Rome. It is so atmospheric. It is so creepy. It is so uh, ominous. The the way that they use soundtrack um, and when they cut the sounds out and you just hear sounds of the cities like birds rustling and things like this. Um, it is Donald Sutherland and Julie Christie and they believe they see um, the ghost of their daughter in in the city of Rome. It's, it's got a, maybe the most believable lovemaking scene on camera. It, uh, it was actually rumored that uh, Julie Christie's either boyfriend or husband at the time, what's his name? Uh, it's actually rumored that after the lovemaking scene, Warren Beatty 
uh, tried to get this movie pulled from uh, UK theaters because uh, Warren Beatty, who was Julie Christie's boyfriend at the time, really thought they were having sex in the in the scene. It is, and nobody had given me, had warned me about that. Not that you need to be warned, but I was watching that scene. And I was like, thank God I'm not watching this with like my mom. Like you know what I'm saying. Just like an old man oh. And then pretended to fall so people would buy me criterions No my head feels weird But if you bought me criter my cry 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 criterions it'd feel great How you guys doing? You guys hanging in there? I know uh, it's going to be quite a lengthy video, but uh, we're getting there. That was the first stack of 11. Got two more stacks of 11 to go. The Virgin Spring. This is a movie by Ingmar Bergman. Uh, before I get into these movies, I've not seen the Ingmar Bergman film. Um, I've heard so many great things about him. Some people call him maybe the best director of all time. So all three of these movies have Max von, Max von Zito in them. Sido? Zito? From... Exorcist fame. I think everybody knows him from Exorcist. This movie came out in 1960, uh, glorious black and white, and the reason why I picked up this movie is that uh, I'm a big fan of a movie called Last House on the Left, directed by Wes Craven, and the Virgin Spring had influenced that movie so much, it's, it's almost essentially uh, quite very much the same movie. It is a tale of revenge, savagery, in medieval Sweden. This is spine number... 321. Next we have The Seventh Seal. And this is another movie. This movie came out in 1957. So three years before The Virgin Spring. What sold me on this movie is, get this, disillusioned and exhausted after a decade of battling in the Crusades, a knight encounters death on a desolate beach and challenges him to a faithful game of chess. Uh, what, bro? That sounds dope. Life sounds dope. This movie sounds dope. To tell you the truth, Last Action Hero. Have you guys seen the movie Last Action Hero? I believe uh, the Grim Reaper from this movie is in Last Action Hero. I could be wrong, but I've never seen this movie. Uh, but I think uh, towards the very end, I think it has a lot to do with that. I know that sounds really dumb. but uh, So this is my uh, second pick for uh, Ingmar Bergman. My second pick for his movies. Uh, we have The Magician, and this movie came out in 1958, a year after uh, The Seventh Seal, and this movie really just, it, it called to me at Barnes & Noble, it has a sp spooky, ominous uh, cover, um, really, uh, I think it's about dueling magicians, and it's got both frightening and funny, shot in rich, glorious, gothic, black and white, <laughs> gothic, black and white, <laughs> um, and that sounded really cool, like, almost like a prestige-esque, uh, type of movie, and, and it just looked really cool, this is spine number 537, I always like to get something that's a little bit more, uh, esoteric, that's a good word, esoteric, way to go, Trez, way to go, using your words, man, you're getting your words on, too bad everything else you say sucks. Next we have Carnival of Souls. This movie came out in 1962. It is spine number number 63. It's directed by Herc Harvey. And for a long time with this movie, I knew it was public domain. Um, there'd be sometimes, like anytime if you see like a compilation, you'd always see Night of the Living Dead. If somebody's watching a movie on television and they don't want to pay the rights to anything else in another movie, they're either watching uh, Carnival of Souls or Night of the Living Dead. Uh, I remember seeing so many long shots. I'd see so many long shots, especially this guy. Uh, it's a spooky old, like, white dude that's wearing rouge, bro. Like, uh, like people dancing, like alone on a pier, and all this kind of craziness. Let's look. Look at that dude, bro. Look at that dude, bro. Look at this dude, bro. No, dude. No. I ain't messing with It's creepy. I ain't messing with that. You know, have you ever met anybody that's like, oh, I'm not gonna watch anything black and white? I'm like, what are you, a communist? Jesus Christ. 
Next, we have a movie by Federico Fellini. This is Eight and a Half. This movie came out in 1963. Glorious black and white. Super it Italiano. Uh, maybe Trez stands for something Italian. Or maybe it doesn't. More than any other movie, if I'm watching like uh, the Criterion Closet, do you know what I'm talking about? If you're going uh, on YouTube and look up the Criterion Collection, um, you always have different filmmakers or actors going into the closet picking out movies. Um, I've never seen so many people say uh, one movie was as influential on filmmaking as Eight and a Half. So that's what got me excited about it. And maybe I'll learn something. Um, uh, do I consider myself a filmmaker? No, I make videos. But who knows one day. I don't care. Uh, I got this big thing where I'm not, I'm not worried about, about time. You know, uh, maybe if I'm like 50 years old or 60 years old, Maybe I'll make a movie. Who knows? Like, if I learn enough, oh, you just got to go for it. Life is full of possibilities, and you have limitless potential. You have limitless opportunities to what you want to do. So who says you can't make a movie at 60 years old or 70 years old or 55 years old? Um, so maybe eight and a half is going to have a profound effect on me. So that's why I'm recommending it to you, because maybe we have some people that are a whole lot closer out there. Uh, to wanting to make movies or making movies and maybe eight and a half will have a profound effect on you. Frederico Fellini. Follow your dreams, y'all. Make videos on YouTube. And do the fly thing. Because you want people to watch. <laughs> <laughs> My next pick, we have The Devil's Backbone. This is Guillermo del Toro. And before I say anything, this movie came out in 2001. Have y'all ever watched an interview with Guillermo del Toro? Doesn't he sound like he just freaking loves horror movies? He just loves cinema and he loves just talking about it and creating it and producing it. And uh, if you ever want to get inspired, go listen listen to Guillermo del Toro talk about uh, Brain Dead or something, uh, Dead Alive for for like 45 minutes, and you'll just be like, dude, I'm gonna. He's a, he, what an inspiring dude. And if you ever seen. Uh, if you ever watched YouTube videos of him going around in his house, he's got a pretty dope house too. All full of uh, horror stuff. He loves HP Lovecraft, all that kind of stuff. Um, and The Devil's Backbone is a old fashioned ghost story. Um, he said the inspiration for this movie was he grew up in Mexico City and he said when he was a child, he had to go to an all boys uh, boarding school, which was the equivalent of like in the United States like a boys prison and he said uh, that he had some ghostly encounters there which kind of set off the narrative of this movie um, his first movie Kronos was kind of a love story almost made uh, he had lost his grandmother and uh, he kind of reversed the roles and uh, put the grandfather in to Kronos which was a a uh, a classical vampire uh, a, a Spanish vampire movie uh, this is spy number 666 six, 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 six. the number of the week I lived alone dun, 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 dun. my mind was blank DVD copy this is spine number two Seven Samurai by Akira Kurosawa so American that I can't pronounce anything and have it sound good uh, this movie came out in 1954 this is a samurai epic that's that's all I know about this movie um, it's considered maybe one of the greatest movies of all time, maybe the greatest movie of all time. They say it's just a must watch. They say it's a must own. Um, it it just brings me back to what I was saying about Japanese culture and Japanese cinema. Um, is that I can't believe that I'd slept on it for so long, and I can't believe it's not more accessible in America to get these movies. This is spine number two, Akira Kurosawa, Seven Samurai. Before I say anything, have you guys seen this? Have you seen the first Police Story? Police Story 2 was great, don't get me wrong. But have you seen the first one? I wanted, I felt like I could, I could do anything after I watched this movie. I got so energized, I did so many karate chops. I wanted to hang from buildings. I wanted to hang from moving buses. I wanted to fight people in the street. Uh, I wanted to get revenge. I wanted to 
take down criminals, man. I'm being dead serious. Didn't know that Jackie Chan could direct action so well. Him and his stunt crew blew me away. There's a scene, really, really every fight scene in the first uh, police story. And in police story two, there's a fight scene in the playground where he kicks, a, he whoops a bunch of dudes. It's amazing. If you guys have never seen this movie, you watch this right now. You watch the first police story and you tell me how your life is after that. You tell me who you fight after that. I'm getting so hyped. I just think about it. Look at that. Look at him. Does he look like he's putting up with any shit? No. Does he look like he's going to whoop some ass? He's going to whoop some ass. He's going to whoop that ass. Look at him. This is 900, 971, 972. Look at him. I'm going insane. Then I want to look at him. Just look at that hair. He's got nice hair. Jackie Chan's got great hair. I don't care. He's still got great hair. Do you know what else? He sings. The, he directed this movie. He wrote this movie. He produced this movie. He, he did all the stunts. He directed this movie. He sings the damn theme song to this movie. There's a, there's a movie. There's a, there's a shot of him just answering phones in the first police story, and he's like, he's got a bunch of phones, and it's the most entertaining thing I've seen in my life because, it just is. Uh, it's got great extras on here. There's great extras with Edgar Wright, uh, one of my favorite directors of all time. Um, I really, I really think you should see this movie, um, and it's it's priced great for you to get two. Um, I know Criterion's can be a little pricey, but you get two movies with this, and um, it's so funny. He is the Bruce Lee, Buster Keaton of Chinese action cinema. Next we have 1966 Cul-de-sac. Roman Polanski again, Donald Pleasance. Uh, this is a gangster movie. It's all I wanna say. Uh, I heard so much about this. This is spine number 577. Um, I'm, I'm so used to Roman Polanski's uh, thrillers or uh, because you got Rosemary's Baby, you got Repulsion, you got From Hell, um, you got Hamlet. You have different movies from Roman Polanski, and I don't remember seeing a uh, a criminal uh, crime drama gangster film from Roman Polanski. So I'm really looking forward to uh, picking this one up. I didn't think this one was going to be at my local Barnes and Noble, but when I saw it, I knew I had to pick it up. Um, it was really cool, really cool. Uh, 1977, cul-de-sac. Said it five times. How about one? When I grew up. I lived in a cul-de-sac, you know. I'm gonna buy a house soon. I'm probably gonna buy one in a cul-de-sac. What else can we say? Cul-de-sac. How's your mom doing? Cul-de-sac. We have David Lynch's Mulholland Drive. This movie came out in 2001. It is 146 minutes, just in case if you wanted to know. It's got Naomi Watts in it. Uh, Naomi Watts was killing it. After, when during The Ring, uh, I believe she was in King Kong. <clears throat> she was freaking killing it at this time, y'all. They give it to her. She's been, uh, she's still in a lot of movies. Naomi Watts is in a lot of movies. I watched one with her the other day. It was kind of a stinker. It was the one where she was like snowed in with her son. And he was bullshitting the whole time. I'm sorry, that shit. Sorry. Sorry if I just spoiled it, but don't watch it. It was terrible. So this movie is about uh, being in Hollywood, living in Hollywood, and the life surrounding Hollywood, but you know it's directed by David Lynch, so there's gonna be some fantastical spins on reality and life and things of that nature. I got this, um, this was the DVD copy, but I was, I'm okay with the DVD copy. It's really nice, really nice booklet, um, a bunch of special features, 4K digital transfer. I know that doesn't mean much being that it's a DVD. I hate to say it, not to just be that guy, but I'm sure the DVD is gonna look really good. So, yeah, I'm really happy with Mulholland Drive. Spot number 779, uh, David Lynch. Next up, we have Repo Man. This movie came out in 1984 and is directed by Alex Cox. And this movie is notorious for its uh, early 80s LA punk scene vibe. So this, I've never seen this. This was a blind buy, but... Um, this stars uh, Emilio Estevez, which I think is really underrated. I miss him being in movies. Um, 
uh, and Henry Dean Stanton, and they have to repossess the Chevy, Chevy Malibu. Sounds cool. Well, I'm cool with that. But maybe is there more to that? Uh, otherworldly? That's what it says. So, um, yeah, so I'm really looking forward. This is spine number 654. Uh, I love the green, white, and black. Um, the, um, but I'm legitly, we have 11 left after this. I'm legitly losing my voice. Um, I never thought, I always hear people on YouTube saying that. But I'm legitly losing my voice. I can feel it. Um, how you guys doing? We're getting there. Uh, uh, last 11 coming up right now. Uh, Keeks, can you edit in some, uh, can you edit in some B-roll? Keep these people on their toes. Today was the first day that I prostitute myself out on the street for you. Criterions. I prostitute myself out on the street for you, Criterions, oh, Criterions, oh, Criterions. I'd sell my own mother for you, I'd sell you, Criterions. that was but it was probably pretty cool cool it's cool you keep on she keeps on growling at stuff I had to switch her dog food and uh, and it's got a picture the dog food's got a picture of a dog on the bag right and she was getting all hype it's like 3 30 in the morning and then she was growling at the freaking bag I'm like dude this is not a dog bro I'm trying to poop see and she's growling she's growling she's growling at that she's growling at the vinyl we hear Hear me. She sounds like a chicken. She's like, Wah. yeah. You hear? It? She's getting, she's getting all hype about that vinyl. Are you okay? It's okay. Do you want me to put it down? Wah. All right, I'm gonna put it down. Jesus. All right. I was trying, Keeks. I was trying to show. I was trying to give. It's okay. It's gone. It's gone. It's gone. Roman Polanski pickups. Um, I've had this movie for a little while. This is Rosemary's Baby. This is a movie that came out in 1968, and this is another one. If you've if you've never seen uh, Hasu or Police Story, I recommend Rosemary's Baby so much. I don't know why I love this movie. Uh, th there's just something about it that I love the old school New York vibes. Um, this movie I was reading in a book called Shock Value that uh, William Castle put a lot of money out on the line for this movie to produce it. And he got so butthurt that uh, they wouldn't let him direct this movie that he was he was like micromanaging uh, Roman Polanski on set. It only took a little while for him to realize that uh, Roman Polanski knew what he was doing, but uh, trusted him. And you can see William Castle, he is the man uh, outside of the phone booth when Rosemary's calling uh, different doctors to check on the baby. So. Rosemary's Baby. This is spine number 630. Next we have Three Outlaw Samurai. And this movie came out in 1964. And it is directed by Hideo Gosha. Gosha? Yeah. So this is the first feature by legendary Hideo Gosha among the most beloved uh, sword fighting films. The origin story is an offshoot of a television phenomena of the same name. I've never seen this movie. Um, I am all about the Japanese uh, black and white releases. I know once I start one movie, uh, it is going to just snowball. I know it is going to just snowball into something uh, brilliantly uh, enveloping. And if you have, like I said, a lot of these are blind buys. I love blind buying. If you have any opinions on these movies, please put them in the comments below. I love reading what you guys have to say. I love hearing what you say about these movies. I love hearing what you pick up. I love hearing it all. If you guys want to say anything, totally don't care. Let me know. Let me know what's on your mind. Let me know what you think of these movies. Do you have any Japanese cinema that you can recommend? Do you have any criterions that you can recommend? Spine number 596. This is Until the End of the World. 
This movie came out in 1991, and it is directed by a Wim Wenders. So the reason why I bought this movie, I know it was supposed to be weird and psychedelic. There's a lot of musicians in it, but the runtime is 287 minutes. This movie is like four, four and a half hours long. But yeah, this was this was a why not buy. Why not buy? Why not? <laughs> And this is spy number 1007. So the next movie we came out in 1922. This is the oldest movie that I own. This is Heixen? Heixen? By, Bender, by Benjamin Christensen. And this is supposed to be about witches, like Santanic stuff. So, yeah. Movie came out in 1922. Tinted black and white uh, Swedish film. Yeah, creepy imagery on that. They say it's a witch's brew of scary, gross, and darkly humorous filmmaking. Spine number 134. This one's still wrapped. Next, we have a movie called The Lore. Look at that. Freaking mermaid or serpent. Is that a serpent? Maybe, probably a mermaid. This movie came out in 2015, and it is directed by... Hey, Chevalicia. And, uh... It's a genre-defying horror musical mashup. Dope. Explores themes of emerging sexual, uh, emerging female sexuality, exploitation, and the compromises of adulthood with a savage energy and originality. Um, anything, like I said, anything in the horror vein, I'm going to pick it up. Uh, so if you've seen any other movie by uh enjoy it, man. Like, really enjoy it. Spine number 896. Funny Games. Okay, this movie came out in 1997, and it is directed by uh, Michael Henke. Henke? Let me say that. Um, and this movie is known for being brutal, uh, comedically dark black comedy, and the... I don't want to spoil anything, but the... There's a major... There's a major point in this movie where it breaks... breaks like, there's a major point in this movie where it breaks the fourth wall. And I think stuff like that is cool. I think it was uh, really cool to see this in, in a movie that's not uh, that's not like a uh, Deadpool movie. You know what I'm saying? Something like that. Like a, like a movie that's like, hey, hold on. Rewind. Um, all right. We have Michelangelo Antonioni's... Antoni Antonioni's blow up. All right, so the reason why I bought this film, this movie came out in 1966, is because of David Hemming. And David Hemming is in a movie called Deep Red. And this has a very uh, voyeuristic uh, point of view to this movie as well. And a lot of the old school Giallo directors uh, are saying that uh, Antonioni's uh, films have much more of a blueprint in Giallo than he gets credit for. So that's what made me go out and pick up this release. And it was actually the first one that was in my hand at Barnes & Noble, even though I kept on going back like days and days later. Spine number 865, Blow Up. We have David Cronenberg's Scanners. And I don't know if you know David Cronenberg, but he directed a movie called The Fly. Did you do it again? No, I'm not... So this is Scanners. A dude's head explodes. Like, really cool. Have you seen that in the movie? This came out in 1981. Uh, yeah, if you're gonna watch it for anything, watch it for that. It's a great headshot. You got Maniac, that's got an amazing, amazing head explosion from Tom Savini. You got Scanners, that has an amazing uh, head explosion. You have Dawn of the Dead in the very beginning that has an amazing head explosion. Um... Yeah. Scanners. Crum we have Shallow Grave. This movie came out in 1994. Uh, this is a movie by Danny Boyle. Uh, I think Danny Boyle is very underrated, even though he's... Did he win an Academy Award for um, Slumdog or Best Picture? Um, I still think he's underrated, man. 28 Days Later uh, is fantastic. Um, I've never seen this one. I'm a big fan of Danny Boyle. 
train spotting. I even like train spotting too. I think I'm the only person on the planet that like train spotting too, even though it's a completely different movie. But um, yeah, I, I hear Ewan McGregor is amazing in this movie. I hear it is, uh, it shows the depths of what humans will do to get money. Wow, wow, wow. I feel like, sometimes I feel like Gordon Ramsay when I'm on here. The soup is so dry. Akiru. This is a film by Akira Kurosawa. This is the second movie on this list. This movie came out in 1952. And, uh, I didn't know much about this movie. My buddy Kale from Instagram, I hope I pronounced your name right, dude. Hope I pronounced it right. But he was like, uh, I think he did a post about his own Criterion collection, collection, and uh, and I, we were we were commenting back and forth, and he straight up told me he was like, dude, if you're gonna pick up one movie, he was like, pick up this one, and I trusted him. That's why, anytime if you guys hit me up on Instagram or if you hit me up on here, um, I love your movie recommendations. That's why I love being a part of this community. I love talking to you guys about it. So please throw them my way. Because I will eventually get to them. Um, like I said, 1952. They say it's a multifaceted look at what it means to be alive. And that sounds... I don't know about you guys, but that sounds amazing. It sounds fantastic to me. Um, yeah. Japanese. Didn't realize how many Japanese pickups I, I had, too. Look at the cinematography. Even though that picture, man. And this is spine number 221. We made it, y'all. Last but not least, uh, I wanted to end this one on one that I had definitely seen. Um, Robert Mitchum, Shelley Winters, Night of the Hunter. I watched this movie with my dad randomly probably about 10 years ago. I was so blown away by the set work, the cinematography, the, the what they showed. This movie came out in 1955. I had no idea they were showing movies like this in 1955. He, Robert Mitchum, is such an evil character in this. He is so manipulative, he is so psychotic, and he is trying to kill these little kids to find uh, money, uh, that they, they, secret money that the, these kids know about. Um, if, you, if you are into uh, movies from the 50s, if you're in into black and white movies, if you're into cinematography, if you're into what constitute as fantastic cinema from this day and age, I suggest that you start with this because it's so good um, and it's so creepy. Some of the shots, there are some underwater shots with a, with a car. Um, I don't want to spoil too much, but there's some underwater shots that are absolutely horrifying. You see... Robert Mitchum slowly uh, become more unhinged and then become more uh, of this monstrosity. He, he literally does the Frankenstein thing without him even knowing in a shot uh, where he's running up his stairs, which if, if you've seen any shot, that's a pretty popular one of this, uh, of this film, and it, is it, it gets you. Um, there are some shots where they have they have him kind of cloaked in shadow and you don't even know he's there it's a creepy like i'm sure this thing blew people way back in 55 man it's a creep it's a creepy one man yeah um yeah night of the hunter roger uh, robert mitchum shelly winters uh thoroughly recommend and that's it you guys we made it we made it we made it through 33 criterion blu-rays and dvds how are you guys doing? Are you still with me? Crazy, right? I could probably make a movie out of this. Um, I'm so, so sorry that it was such a long video, but I wasn't going to break it up into parts. Um, yeah, because I feel like, uh, I feel like other channels have better pickups with Criterion. So I figured I'd do my, my one for the time being until I have another big stack and then I'll do it then. Uh, until then... Uh, much love. Tell people you love them. Give people hugs. Do your thing. Enjoy life. Watch some good movies. You know, follow your dreams. You know, not to sound all cheesy, but man, gotta do it. Why not?
be yourself. Love yourself. Get a dog, man. Get a dog that can't hear. That's what I did. Thank you for being here. Thank you for watching. And until next time, I've been Trez. Keeks is over here sleeping. That's Keeks.